Hello, I'm Stuart Craner, co-founder of Thinkers50 and director of the Business Ecosystem Alliance. Welcome to this session, Exploring Rendenhai. If you would like translation into Japanese or Mandarin, please click the language button at the bottom of the screen. We have a stellar lineup who will help us get into the practicalities of making some of the great ideas around Rendenhai make the leap from theory into reality. We have some great speakers, so it promises to be a really interesting session. As always, please send in your questions and I'll be sure to pass them on later in the session. Joining us today are Joost Minar, the co-founder of Corporate Rebels. Check out Joost's book, Corporate Rebels, and the Corporate Rebels website for some fantastic stories of truly world-changing organizations. Alongside Joost, we have Michael Lee and Wesley Koo from the French Business School, INSEAD, who will share insights about how Renden Hai is practiced at higher in China. Then we have Oleg Remiga from the Moscow School of Management, Skolkovo, who will share insights about how Renden Hai is practiced at higher in Russia. We have Zhao Domingos from Fujitsu, Fujitsu Europe, who will provide insights on how Renden Hai is being practiced at Fujitsu Europe. Zhao's company is the first in the world to receive Renden Hai certification from the EFMD. And finally, we have Harsha Baradawaj from Jaipur Rugs, one of the most brilliant companies I've, I've ever encountered, who corporate rebels have written about really powerfully. Great company. And Harsha will share insights about how Renden Hai is practiced at Jaipur, Jaipur Rugs. So let's start with Yoast. Uh, Yoast, you, you assembled this lineup of great speakers to explain how aspects of Renden Hai are being reinterpreted and put into practice. Can you explain your logic? Mm, uh, thanks, uh, Stuart. Uh, uh, yes, sure. Uh, I have invited this lineup um, to show actually different stages of, uh, of Renan AI. So we will start the session with um, uh, Wes and Mike um, sharing some of the highlights of uh, the Insiat business case we have been developing over the last year. Um, about how Renari is actually pioneered in China. So this will be more about the newest developments uh, of, of Renanhai. Then uh, Oleg will follow up with showing how some of those elements are translated to some of the subsidiaries in, of higher in other cultures, uh, in this case in, in higher Russia. Um, then we will go on to, to Zhao, we will show how Renanhi can be actually transformed or can be adapted by other companies that are completely outside of the, the higher uh, ecosystem. And we will finish with Harsha that will um, give their perspective uh, of more of a, of a company that's on the beginning of implementing parts of Renanhi in the, in the company. So we'll have two perspectives of other companies like Zhao will give a little bit more perspective of uh, uh, a company that's all already longer on the journey of implementing some elements of Renanhi and Harsha will more, I guess, talk about uh, the exploration of which elements could work in, the, in their culture and which ones um, uh, not. Um, so that's the logic. I hope it's, uh, it's kind of logical. Um, I will stop with that and give the floor to, to Mike. So Mike, please. Go ahead. So I think Wesley's going to kick us off, and then I will chime in afterwards. Thanks, Joost. Yeah, uh, thank you, Joost, for the kind introduction. Uh, my name is Wesley, and I'm the Assistant Professor of Strategy at INSEAD. Um, uh, we're known as the Business School for the World, and I'm based in Singapore. Mike is based in France. Uh, I'm actually speaking to you from Los Angeles right now, so it shows you the international nature of this collaboration and, uh, and the whole process involving Renan Hei and, and the research of it. So today, Mike and I want to share our kind of insights um, on a business school case that we have written uh, along with Yost Minar from the Corporate Rebels. Uh, we want to show you the overview of the case is about and also a couple of the main teaching points going forward. Mike, next slide. So we have spent a painstaking effort in the past a year and a half or so to interview numerous you know, uh, top managers at higher and also the middle managers and also external stakeholders in the Renan Hei process uh, to understand what this process is about and understand how higher is kind of structuring its own 
uh, internal ecosystem uh, to pursue new innovations. So as an overview, the case uh, contains four main parts. We start off by looking at the consumer market landscape and uh, take notes of the rise of smart products and services around the world. And second, uh, we take a look at how higher is pursuing a strategy called an ecosystem brand strategy. Uh, and third, uh, we go over the history of Rendang Hei and uh, briefly describe the, the, the unique organizing model uh, of Rendang Hei. And fourth is read the meat of this case, where we go into these detailed examples about the Peking Real Stock Project and also other, other examples of EMCs uh, in the Renang Hei model and talk about the organizing principles that make uh, the EMC system a success. Next slide, please. All right, so let's briefly talk about the rise of smart products and services and borrow from Porter and Heppelman's model from 2014. So from the beginning, right? So we have individual products that really don't talk to each other. So here you can have a car, you can have a chainsaw, you can have a tractor that don't really talk to each other. But what makes a product smart is the fact that they are talking to one another and connected to one another. So if you take a look at step two and step three here, you'll see that these you know, products are, have these added features that allow them to communicate with uh, one another. And step four and five is even more advanced where you have these add-on systems that allow these products to self-update and upgrade while talking to one another. So uh, the rise of smart products and services is really the backdrop of our teaching case that uh, uh, kind of uh, produces this environment that's fruitful for a business model like Renan Hui. Thank you, Mike. So just to show you a couple of quotes we'll gather in the process. So Mr. John Raymond back in 2016 was already talking about, oh, um, the day of the traditional home appliances are gone. We really need to have an initiative to softwareize the traditional home appliance uh, landscape in order for them to uh, be smart uh, in, the, in the true sense of the word. And in our interview with Mr. Wu uh, who is the head of Internet of Food at Hire and, uh, and vice president at Hire Group, and then Mr. Wu told us that you know, as early as 2014, Hire started thinking about transforming the traditional appliance landscape into an ecosystem or platform. And in 2015, the phenomenon of smartphones and smart appliances was really driving this revolution because they saw that IoT, Internet of Things, uh, is really about the connections uh, and they needed to form this basis of connections between home appliances. So to give you a concrete example of what kind of smart products or connections we're talking about, here is a, 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 a photo illustrating the three-winged bird ecosystem brands at Hire. So in this case, you know, if you go home and say one command, something like, oh, I want to take a nap, right? So the one command can trigger a series of actions, actions among these different appliances the home uh, and devices. Uh, so for example, the vacuum cleaner can, can get started on the cleaning uh, and the AC can get started. And then the humidifier uh, adjusts the humidity to a, a, a comfortable degree that is for the purpose of napping. So that example of how smart products work and why Hire decided to adopt an ecosystem strategy to integrate these different home appliances in order for them to work with one another. So here comes the, the first major teaching point of this uh, case uh, that, that we wrote. Uh, I think we, uh, we, we had a session on ecosystem before, but here uh, there, there's, uh, there's one strategic tension I'd like to highlight. So in ecosystems, you have a lot of external players join in in order to create value for a particular purpose. And there's a tension between control and autonomy. On one hand, as the owner of the ecosystem, uh, in this case, higher, you want to exert tight control on the end products so that the users or the end customers can see a valuable uh, experience. But on the other hand, you want to grant autonomy uh, to these external players in order for them to be innovative. One more click, Mike. Uh, no, there, there's, there are two more pictures before, yeah. Yes. 
So, so examples, uh, for example, for autonomy uh, would be, you know, a platform like Wikipedia, where these external players, uh, you, know, you and me can post articles. And in China, you can you know, you know, think of platforms like Zhihu, right? All the users can post articles. So we're granting autonomy to these users to be innovative. And on the other extreme, you have Tesla, who wants to control their battery manufacturers so that they build this giant gigafactory uh, these gigafactories around the world in order to have Panasonic produce these battery systems inside uh, their, uh, uh, underneath the roof, if you will. Okay, one more slide. And higher in this case adopts a very unique model in Renan Heyi because it's really an internal ecosystem. High, what higher is try, trying to do is to, is to uh, uh, get these internal participants, whether it be an individual or a department, uh, to bid for projects so that they're acting like competitors with one another. Uh, in this competition, uh, uh, you are actually granting them more autonomy uh, for these players to, to, to innovate, to compete one another, one another. So these players are actually internal players, but in a way, they're also external as well. So in summary, through the strategic approach, what Hire is trying to do is to achieve a unique balance between tight control and full autonomy. Okay, so I'll leave you at this point and hand the floor over to Mike to talk, talk about some of the organizing or organizational principles that underlie the Nanghur model. Go ahead, Mike. Thanks, Wesley. Yeah, and so just as a context, so Wesley uh, is a, strat a, a professor of strategy. And so his interest in this case was really uh, more at the strategic level, like the unique strategy that, that Hire has, has sort of adopted over the last several years. And I'm a professor of organizational uh, behavior with a focus on organizational design. And so I was really interested in writing this case to explore the, the sort of unique uh, and new features of uh, the Rin Dan Hui model. And so as Wesley described, uh, you know, along with uh, with their with with hires evolution strategic evolution they also evolved their internal organization and broadly we talk about this in the case as this evolution from what hire described as or called platforms which at hire were really these groups of loosely connected micro enterprises um, so often connected by product line but otherwise not really coordinating or collaborating in any sort of meaningful way to the newest sort of uh, evolution of the model, which are the introduction of these ecosystem micro communities or EMCs, which are coordinated networks of micro enterprises and also external partners that collaborate to create a set of integrated products and services. And so we really see this evolution as linking very clearly with the development of this strategy to focus on building these quote unquote smart projects, these smart products. And so let me sort of uh, illustrate this. And you, we use this case, sort of this case within a case of the Peking Roast Duck project that was part of, uh, was created by the smart cooking EMC. And um, this was the first project of this, uh, of this new EMC that uh, broadly was interested in how do we bring sort of the experience of being at a restaurant and sort of the quality of those dishes and have that be possible at home. And this was really sparked, uh, of course, with the emergence of the pandemic. And as people now were spending all of their time at a home, uh, this, this idea was really generated. And their first uh, sort of project or target was to create the Peking roast duck. And for those of you who may not uh, know about this or haven't uh, had the, the, the privilege to enjoy this dish, uh, this is a classic celebratory dish in China that goes back centuries. Uh, the preparation is extremely elaborate and involves ducks, special ducks that are raised in a very particular way and then a very unique and long preparation of the duck. And then finally roasting the duck in some cases over, uh, or at least in traditional uh, ways over a wood fire. And so as you can see, this is a very difficult dish to prepare at home. And, and most consider this as something you only eat out uh, at a restaurant. But uh, the Smart Cooking EMC wanted to take this 
as a challenge, right? To sort of this, this powerful symbol, if they could make the Peking roast duck accessible and doable at home, then they really could feel like they, they sort of had a foothold in the market. But this really required creating a very integrated, as you can see, experience and required bringing together both uh, micro enterprises, a variety of micro enterprises internally uh, and also external partners. And just to give you a highlight of that, so this is a quote from one of the members of this smart cooking EMC, and he talks about the challenges of sort of needing to design a whole process from the ducks, the farms, the factories, to the actual recipes, and then to the actual appliances that are needed, both the refrigerator to store the ducks at a very specific temperature, to the oven that actually cooks the ducks, right? And so they needed to bring all of these different nodes and partners together. And that's really where the EMC structure came in. It enabled this type of coordination and integration across boundaries. And so just to kind of highlight some of the critical pieces of the EMC structure, obviously we don't have a ton of time here, so just wanted to provide some of the key highlights. Um, the EMC structure is really this lightweight structure that enables these flexible connections across boundaries and across nodes. And so there is some centralized approval for the creation of the EMC. And this ensures minimal alignment with the strategic sort of focus of the broader corporation, right? You don't want just any EMC to be started, but there are very minimal startup resources required. So it doesn't require generally hiring a lot of new staff. Instead, they're pulling staff from sort of these different uh, MEs and also external partners. And they're using the, the profit sharing, sort of the, the guarantee, the shares of future profits to incentivize particip participation rather than needing to sort of provide uh, guaranteed compensation. And this also incentivizes individuals to participate across status and seniority levels internally, as well as, of course, externally. There's a the use of dynamic contracts. So they're called EMC contracts, which are evolving uh, uh, regularly. And what these EMC contracts do is they help establish clear expectations and help coordinate work. And then finally, there is the importance of the EMC leader, right? Because the leader actually has to set the vision for the EMC, has to convince others that this is a good idea and has to be able to attract others to this idea um, and convince others that this is worth them putting in their time uh, uh, to actually uh, work on this. And then also, the ability to manage this fairly complex coordination and communication. And so just wanted to touch on some of the key teaching themes from an organizational design perspective that I think this case uh, can really highlight and that I'm excited to, to, to teach. And so one is just sort of quickly, the alignment between strategy and structure, right? This, this is a classic principle of organizational design. And I think this is a really interesting case of how the evolution of this ecosystem brand strategy that Wesley talked about really also aligned with the, the evolution of this, this internal organizing model to enable that. Second, I think just this introduction of marketplace dynamics within organizational hierarchy. So this, these sort of internal hybrids are becoming more and more common, but many students that enter the MBA classroom or have only worked in conventional hierarchies. And so actually opening their minds to these alternatives, I think is becoming, is very, very powerful use of the case. Third, I think is that this case highlights how organizations can resolve some core organizational design tensions. So for instance, the tension between agility and flexibility on the one hand and coordination and control on the other. And then also the tension at the individual level between really having high upside uh, and strong sort of high powered incentives, but also sort of the trade-offs with stability and job security. And then finally, which I think this is a theme that we'll be talking a lot about today in this, this panel, the cultural contingencies of this type of model, right? It adds, I think this, this, this case really begs the question of how portable is this model and what aspects of this model will, are, more, are, are the most portable and which aspects of the model may be less portable and may depend more on uh, sort of having the right cultural context. And I'm excited to, to hear from others on this panel who I think will be shedding light on this. Mike and Wesley, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, a quick question's come in from uh, Stefan Berchtold, uh, which he's asking about the um, 
uh, the EMCs and whether that's altered by working remotely? Do they work remotely or is it all um, face to face? I, w I wonder how the pandemics have affected that. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I, this is not something that we uh, we focused on too much in our case. I mean, actually, at the time of our research and writing of the case, uh, they were already back uh, in the office, right? So China had very little community spread, and so everyone is, was at the office. I think it's an interesting question that we don't really explore: is is how virtual work might uh, might sort of be compatible or less compatible with this model? Can can I can I jump in, uh, Mike? Like uh, uh, I know that at Hire they have been working on introducing an online tool called uh, the Workbench. I guess maybe later in the, the sessions they will talk about some people will talk about that. But this is like an online tool which they are developing now for one half year, where it's completely where they want to completely um, make all this kind of contracting and communication around contracts uh, to do everything online. So this actually is running. And and, and um, previously, before our research, they were doing many of the meetings um, offline. They were actually signing contracts on paper. Nowadays, that's different. Everything nowadays is uh, happening online with like a communication channels uh, where every, every member of, of the higher ecosystem can uh, approach somebody else without any boundary. Okay, thank you very much, Mike and Wesley. Sorry, we need, we need to move on. Uh, we've got limited time. And now to, to Russia and Oleg. Uh, what, what's the Russian take on Renden High? Uh, dear, dear Stuart, dear, dear you, st thank you so so much for br bringing us here to all the participants, Chinese participants. Uh, Nihao, so I would like to give us uh, actually five uh, reasons why we believe uh, our Russian hire has a huge success on the local market. Uh, we have been developing, we're still in the process of a case study about them. So this is the preliminary highlights and results which we get from uh, from them. So uh, the first thing I would like to uh, give you a short uh, description of what infrastructure Duhar has in Russia. So uh, they are starting their operations in 2013 uh, by only ha having uh, the sales team here and pro pro providing their pro products for Russian clients. Then as of uh, now, they're having actually free uh, fa factories in, in, in Russia, one of which produces fridges and freezers. A another is focusing on washing machines. And the third one uh, is producing uh, um, uh, cons uh, consumer goods and uh, electronics. They are planning to build another fa fa factory uh, in the uh, field of creating spare parts and now is making an R&D center. In terms of uh, the volume, Hire is actually one of the biggest investor, foreign investor from China uh, in Russia in 2019. Uh, their investments to the Russian economy was actually 50% of all Chinese investments to Russia. Very, very huge number. Very important factor which gives them actually the success when I'm uh, telling about uh, this structure is that their factories is actually uh, see, uh, made not in the uh, western part of Russia where all the economic activities are, but in the Tatar re region, a special, in a special economic zo zone and industrial park where the cost of labor is pretty low, but the access to, um, uh, to production chains are closer. And what's more, they have a special um, uh, uh, special tax um, uh, legislature there. So first factor which we find, it's not directly connected to Zhang Danhui, but uh, very important to the success of the company. This is, first of all, the focus on the production because they started from the factory of uh, by pro pro producing fridges and actually listening to, to the clients. This is the idea, zero distance to the client they hear what the market needs. So they started from fridges, then go into washing machines, and then go, go, go into another electronic devices. And ge geography, which always matters in, in Russia since we're a big country. So we always need to think where to start. 
the second thing, if you look at the organization structure of the Russian higher, there are actually two big uh, EMCs under that. One of that is uh, market EMC, and another is ma ma manufacturing EMC. If you look at the market EMC, uh, they're basically, uh, uh, under it, you can see all the processes which connected to sales, uh, uh, after sale services, marketing, and, and all that stuff. If you look at the manufacturing EFC, this is the standard pro production pro pro process where you got activities as um, um, manage the warehouse or uh, sub uh, su supply chains, all that stuff. It's important so that HIRE started to implement this kind of structure at the beginning of uh, uh, the expansion of the Russian market. And what's more, and I like that colleagues from INSAT highlighted that in their notes that uh, the leaders of EMC was very crucial for, for them. So uh, usually Chinese companies in Russia take chi Chinese experts and put them as the heads of the company. This time, the leader of the EMC was actually took from the industry. So he was professional, ambitious, motivated, who can really motivate and make the team work. So uh, uh, the key factor here also very important that under this EMC structure lies uh, operational platforms as it is in a standard model of Zhen uh, Fi, which covers finance, higher IT and all that stuff. It's very important to look at the, um, uh, how actually headquarters and the local office has been connected. So at the beginning, basically all the platforms was covered by headquarters. I mean, finance, basically legal and all the team was executed from headquarters. So that was initial control uh, within the company. But uh, that was the year of 2013. But then year by year, they started to delegate uh, these uh, platforms and these activities on local EMCs. So this is important things just to share the control with the local offices. So as it is now the year of 2029, headquarters uh, from uh, had only one control within Russian hire in terms of, of platform. This is the research and uh, development and some pro product development activities. Nevertheless, they are also pl planning to give this to local authors uh, in uh, presumably two, two years when the local R&D center will, will be created. So uh, the second factor, the success factor is uh, how uh, the headquarters and the local operations has been organized. The delegation from headquarters to local offices to local EMCs was crucial. Uh, then we dig a lot into the um, manufacturing EMC and we found that at the beginning, it was actually very classical. The production uh, platform was organized according to classical production lines. And then they, impl uh, they implemented the Zhen Dai Fi framework, basically through uh, profit share sharing and smart contracts within the, the factories and actually change the initiatives for uh, the uh, basic workers. But at that time, they had a very interesting legal issue. This is the cultural as aspect. The thing is that according to the Russian legislature, you can, your employee, like a usual worker at factory, he cannot uh, be part in the profit share sharing, according to Russia uh, legislature. So legally, you can uh, not uh, do, do, do this. So how Russia actually experimented on that and through bonus management, uh, they injected uh, in, in, indirectly this uh, incentive mechanism, and that actually spiked uh, the innovations within the usual workers, within uh, the um, manufacturing EMCs, and uh, that was the crucial factor for HAR actually to develop their new models, effectiveness, and innovations uh, within uh, their, their, uh, their production um, lines. It's important, actually, this uh, innovation factor within uh, Russian Higher because if you look at the SCAR uh, scorecard, now higher Russia is now uh, on the stage, if you look at eco result at the stage of pre-premium brand, 
And in terms of uh, EMC contract, how Russia is on the stage of self-motivation. So to develop their position on the market, and as it is now, they're focusing as being like the leading position as a premium brand, they would like to go to smart home platform and later on to echo platform, ecosystem platform, pro pro providing all the means of uh, white goods and interconnectedness between them to the client. Without innovations, it is impossible to be done. Uh, and of course, if we look at deeper at the market EMC, then we can see very uh, big results, how actually the market share of higher Russia changes. And this is a solid numbers, because when we work with, for example, our clients regarding Gendai Fee, they always say, hey guys, how we measure success? Uh, and this is the numbers which Russian hire basically has. So if you look at market share of Russian hire, in 2013, it was 1.4%. And in 2020, it has increased to 14%, one for uh, uh, on, on, on the Russian market. This is regarding the wide goods industry. If you look at the refrigerator industry in Russia, it's even higher than it's now 17%. If you look at brand awareness of Russian higher, in 2013, it was like 17%. Now it's 53%. Basically, now the clients knows them better, much more better. And the business has grown 14 times in seven years. Um, how, how it has been even done? Even during the COVID crisis, the share of the market share of Russian hire increased by 2%. Uh, that was done through promoters and partners because uh, during the COVID crisis, the Zhandai model within the sales team of Russian hires um, uh, actually made a very good re results since it's, it is very adaptive. Uh, they give more um, flexibility to promoters and partners to be independent in terms of the clients, of how they pro pro promote higher goods, and they have a very good result in, in this field. And what's more, now higher Russia is developing, I've talked a lot about innovations, they're de developing more uh, to uh, e-commerce platform. So the next step after going into online sales through promoters and partners, now High Russia is going deeper into building an e-commerce platform where users can buy all the initial goods and services on that, uh, on that platform. So it has the name of Evo application. So I hope this product is going to be a huge success on the market. So presumably uh, that's it what I want to uh, say. Of course, it's a highlights. 10 minutes is not enough maybe to present uh, in all the details of what we, uh, which has happened in high Russia. But still these five fa factors of success, which we did, uh, which we see in high Russia says that first, Zhendanghi can be applied in Russia with the Russian specifics. And the second point is that by doing this, at least in the case of higher Russia, you can achieve a pretty measurable and good success. Thank you so much. Brilliant, Oleg, thank you, thank you very much. I think the, the level of ad adaptation is, 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 is really interesting. And I think that, that will become clear as well when we uh, learn more from our next speaker, who is Zhao Domingos. Uh, Zhao is from Fujitsu Europe. Uh, Fujitsu is a hugely innovative company. It developed the world's fastest supercomputer. Uh, but has a, a very strong Japanese uh, culture based on Japanese engineering excellence. Uh, but Zhao has, has, has helped Fujitsu Europe be the first organization to be certified by the EFMD with, in, in Renden High. So Zhao, could you share what, what you've done and, and what you've learned? Of course, Stuart. Uh, first, let me thank you and, and you for the invitation and also uh, to the rest of the panel. It's good to come uh, session after session and still learn a lot about Renden Hay. So uh, thank you to Oleg and, and the two colleagues from INSEAD. It, it's really interesting. So I'm, I'm going to put on the screen uh, a presentation or a few charts that uh, from a Fujitsu point of view, I would like to, to share with the panel today and with uh, everyone that is listening. Uh, I, I always like to talk about Brendan Hay, but to give first the context of uh, 
who we are and uh, what we are trying to do. And uh, and Stuart, you were very kind with your initial words on Fujitsu. So just so that everyone knows, we're, we're a Japanese-based company that is more than 80 years old. And uh, one of the things I, I that also triggered my mind uh, when learning about Rendon Hay and learning about Hire is that in Fujitsu, we have this objective to have another 80 years to live. Uh, after had been doing the first 80. And uh, one of the examples that uh, in business schools, in sessions like this one, everyone always talks about is the example of Kodak. So Fujitsu is an organization that culturally also is uh, afraid of missing out on opportunities. And the topics of innovation and adaptation are, are really important uh, to us. So throughout time and through our more than 80 years of history, uh, we have uh, evolved and adapt uh, and uh, we started actually as a, as a telecommunication equipment manufacturer, who then moved into uh, computer manufacturers and then, and then into services business around IT. And uh, our big, big objective today, and I think you'll see quite well how this links with uh, the IoT uh, paradigm shift that, uh, that CEO Zhang from Hire talks about, is that we wanna become uh, a digital uh, technology company that supports our customers in their uh, in their um, in their digital technology challenges. So, um, a key a key problem that we were facing at the time is that uh, the organization the organizational model that we had uh, was too dependent on our traditional business. And what we saw is that the new areas of business around again digital technologies or cloud uh, were not growing fast enough. We were very often outpaced by the market, not outpaced by our traditional competitors, but outpaced by new competitors, smaller, uh, more agile companies that uh, were faster in in uh, in operating than than us. So uh, when I think two years ago, I had the chance to hear a session from uh, CEO Zhang uh, and and hear the higher experience, the micro enterprises concept. Uh, resonated quite well with me as a, as a vehicle to operate that change. So what we were looking for was to create empowered teams so that we could be change uh, faster and changing to the market. We wanted to create also an organization that uh, from the point of view of the burdens that the big uh, elephant type of company brings uh, takes the the barriers out so that people can be closer to customers. So the zero distance to customer concept that I think Oleg, you also mentioned for Russia. Uh, and and this, was, uh, this was a big shift for us. So we, we sort of broke our organization in, in three blocks. Uh, one that uh, we call the, the, the sustaining the course or the performance zone. So our traditional business and, and making sure that uh, we continue to drive that because uh, the day-to-day -day of the company is dependent on that. Then obviously you have a, a group of functions and other departments in the organization that need to enable that performance to happen and drive productivity. But for the new areas, we decided to carve them out of our traditional business and we created micro enterprises. So we, we uh, as I think you also mentioned, Oleg, by the way, we, we, for example, in Europe, there are certain things which were not possible for us uh, in comparison to, to, to hire, for example, the profit sharing mechanisms, et cetera, need to be different. So we used, again, uh, bonus or incentive schemes. We aligned those. Uh, but with, let's say, adapting to our own reality uh, and around uh, the topics I mentioned, like digital business, um, clouds, and also cybersecurity, which were new areas we were exploring in Fujitsu, uh, we created across the five of the countries that I uh, manage 14 micro enterprises. And um, what we have done is uh, we created then this, these 14 micro enterprises. We, we got together around 113 people. So that was our initial experience. Uh, we brought people that were before uh, sort of broken into the different silos of the organization. So we brought people from sales, from our pre-sales departments, from our consulting units that work these teams. And we structured uh, the micro enterprises uh, uh, with, with, uh, with those individuals. Um, we have made them budget owners, so they are they have PNL responsibility uh, to the fullest, uh, like uh, like a, like if they were uh, their own independent uh, company. 
and we have delegated to them uh, a group of, uh, we call it delegation of authority, but a, a group of, uh, uh, or a uh, decision-making power that we thought was, was relevant for them. So they are uh, the ones who can define their own um, go-to-market strategy. So what they wanna sell, to who they wanna sell and how to push those offerings. Uh, they don't need to ask any central authorization to do business so they can approve deals, decide on margins, and, uh, and, and move forward with that. They have also full delegation on, on hiring, on topics like uh, training, travel expenses, and also they are free to, de to, do, to design their own team governance schemes. So we don't impose any sort of uh, meeting agendas or meeting schedules or things they need to do. So we try to take as much as possible uh, that out of their way. Um, there were some aspects that uh, I was probably not as brave as, as some other Rendon Hay implementations. Uh, so uh, we have, uh, from a portfolio point of view, they do not design their own portfolio because we have uh, a group-wide portfolio that we need uh, to respect. They can adapt it, but not change it. Uh, topics like branding, for example, they cannot uh, decide uh, to uh, get off the Fujitsu branding name. Um, these are things that we will potentially revisit at some point in time, but as, uh, as our first part of the journey, we didn't change that. And then uh, last point I would mention, uh, which I think is quite important for, for companies uh, who are not uh, adapting uh, just in one go, uh, Rend and Hay or micro enterprises to the entire organization. I think it's important that there is a cultural shift. So we have built a small uh, central team to facilitate any problems that uh, the micro enterprises would encounter to make sure that uh, if other departments were raising barriers in Fujitsu, because there is always a bit of a resistance to change uh, from the traditional organization. Uh, we were uh, making sure that uh, that that was tackled and that we were supporting the micro enterprises in their journey. Um, last point, and I, I know a lot of companies also mentioned that, uh, uh, and I do recognize that financials play a key role in uh, in every metric and any in every conversation in the corporate world. But for us, this was uh, about business growth, obviously, but not only. Uh, we really wanted to uh, increase employee engagement and customer satisfaction. So for us, this was critical. Um, I, I mentioned this in the earlier session uh, to Stuart and Joost and, and those of you who are listening. In terms of results, and we have been on this for 18 months, uh, we have seen uh, our digital business uh, grow more than twofold. So we doubled and in some case tripled the size of our business in the digital areas. In the cloud space, we are growing double digits and above market average. Uh, our employee engagement has, ro has uh, risen by more than 10 points and is currently sitting above benchmark. And, uh, and, for, and for customer satisfaction, we completely in just one year took out uh, um, uh, any dissatisfied customers, so detractors, and we have currently today uh, I think a, a pretty good uh, net promoter score for these areas of business that we are tackling. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy with what we have achieved. I'm not sure I always say this where we're headed. Uh, we are creating more micro enterprises. We are testing this in this concept in new areas of our organization. Uh, maybe one day the entire organization will probably look a lot more like, like higher does. Maybe not, then we'll stick with, with the ones we have. But that's the journey we're in, and, I, and for us, this is a learning journey more than anything. And um, and uh, this is the process we have gone through, uh, Stuart. And and you. So I hope this has been useful to give a context on on Fujitsu's journey. That was brilliant, Jao. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, can, can we just do deal with a, a question from uh, John? John Ingham talks about the. Uh, he said the downside of this approach tends to be tensions between the carved out innovation areas and the traditional parts of the business. So I suppose, well, what yeah. he's saying in your case, is there a tension between what you're doing in Europe and yeah. Fujitsu worldwide? And how do you manage yeah. that? No, so, so between Europe and the rest of the organization, there is, that's not where the tension is, but because not, I didn't shift my entire organization into the micro enterprise model or adopted random hay across the entire organization, there are tensions between the micro enterprises we have created in each territory and the existing business. 
Uh, I think uh, it, uh, it sounds naive, but it goes a lot about communication, reinforcing the message. It go, it, it, uh, I, I spend, uh, although this is not the biggest part of my business yet, I would say that I spend approximately 50% of my time with the micro enterprises uh, and with uh, the rest of the teams, uh, talking to them, removing barriers, explaining what we're doing, uh, involving other people, also launching the challenge if they want in the traditional areas to launch such concepts and how we would do that. So my uh, my solution so far, Stuart, seems like a candid one, but is communication, 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 and, and be very attentive to where those tensions are. Thank you very much, Xiao. Yeah, that, that, that was great. Now, we're under time pressure, so we're coming to our final, final speaker. Um, Harsha Baradwaj from Jaipur Rugs. And Jaipur Rugs is a, a fantastic story, brilliant company. Uh, Harsha, what, what do you make of all this and, what, and what's, your, what's your take on Renden High? Uh, thanks, Stuart. Thanks for uh, kind words. Uh, I hope it's clear to the audience. Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Thank you to all the other panelists uh, who gave me a lot more insights about it than me today. Uh, in the last couple of years, uh, the founder of Jaipur Rex, Inke Chaudhary, have been meeting a lot of people in the community of tea and self-management and various other uh, ways of calling the better ways of working environment. And we have learned a lot from these people and we tried a few bits uh, in our organization and we, I would like to share what we have learned, what we have implemented as experiment and we would, I would like to share the success stories as well. Uh, just giving you a brief about our organization on uh, the right side of the screen, you have Nandkishor Chaudhary who is called as NKC, is the founder of Jaipur Rex. He started uh, Jaipur Rex in 1978, borrowing $200 from his father. Uh, by setting up two looms at his home. At this point in time, these weavers were considered as untouchables in the uh, country. And uh, while working with these people, even his own family looked down upon him for working with him, with these people. And uh, at the same time, the weavers who used to work with contractors were completely exploited in terms of financial terms and uh, the way uh, the knowledge is being distributed among the weavers. At, uh, at that point in time, NKC uh, saw the creative capacity in these weavers and he started celebrating with the weavers so much so that in the year 96, with, uh, when we had a good amount of profits generated, we gathered around 6,000 weavers that we have had back then in, a one, in one place to distribute the profit generated as a bonus and also celebrate it as a festival. As an individual, he always had uh, an eye towards bringing out the potential of human beings out. He wanted people to work at their fullest capacities. Following his footsteps, uh, there was this interesting project that had come up in the year 2012 called Manchaha, which means from the heart. Traditionally, in any carpet industry, designs of carpets were given by academically qualified designers to the weavers to weave. However, uh, in this particular project, weavers were uh, allowed, or I don't know if I can use the word allowed, but weavers were asked to design the carpets by themselves. This was the first time in the history where weavers were looked as the designers, as the artists, and their creative capacity has come out in a way that today we have won around six global design awards for our weavers who have designed these carpets. These carpets uh, designs, they range from uh, various aspects of their lives, what they see in their day-to-day -day life. And uh, the recent carpet, which had won uh, the design, uh, Global Design Award, uh, was in lines of creating a world of machines. Trust me, these women who are designing these carpets have never been to primary schools. They have not even been to a place outside their village. For them, this matters huge. And uh, for NKC, this is what he wanted to see 
in the community that we have been working with. To, to scale this project, we have uh, fortunately come across meeting used Minar uh, a, a year ago, who is the co-founder of Corporate Rebels. And then he has introduced us to various people, which includes uh, Zhang Rumin, Yost de Blanc, and Dunia Riverter as well. And uh, last year in 2020, Rendon Hay opened talk. NKC was one of the guest speakers and he's the winner of uh, Zero Distance Award 2020. From that, uh, the respect, uh, the mutual respect between Zhang Rumin and NKC had taken to the new heights where if you see the center screen here, this is a handwritten letter by Zhang Rumin, which he had sent to NKC very recently. And um, in this particular journey, uh, Dunya Reverter has helped us a lot in bringing the theory to the practical manner. Uh, the whole of the project that we are experimenting on with our weavers has been co-created with, with Dunya Reverter. And we have picked up a few lessons which we wanted to adapt. Few of those are um, self-managed teams and a standard rhythm, building ownership among the weavers and peer-to-peer -peer learning as well as feedback. And this is what we are doing right now. If you look at the screen, these are, consider these as the weavers of a particular loom. We might have one, two, six weavers in, on any particular loom and uh, they work in different villages across 600 villages in the rural parts of India. And traditionally the system is like that we have allocated a bunch of villages into each branch. And we have around eight branches like this and each branch may have around 200 to 300 uh, looms where we have around 700 to 1200 weavers. And Traditionally, the system has been developed in a way that each branch has a branch manager under whom there are four to six quality supervisors whose responsibility is to monitor the progress of the carpets and the quality of the carpets. Over the last 40 years, because of the way we started working in this manner, it has become the way that the relation between organization and weavers has become a more of a transactional one and the quality, the ownership of the carpet uh, were not considered to be a part of weavers job role. And they were also happy because they had somebody else to take care of the carpet's quality. However, in the traditional system, it is uh, expected that the weavers who are weaving the carpets are, uh, are, are to be able to uh, take the uh, quality aspects of the carpet as well. And what we did in this experiment is that we have reorganized these looms into groups. In each group, we may have two to four looms where we may have up to maximum 14 number of weavers working as a team. These weavers have been weaving for about 20 to 25 years in their lives. And they are well aware of all the aspects of weaving a carpet. However, since we have started calling quality supervisor and it looked like it is their responsibility to take care of the quality of the carpet, weavers never bothered to take care of the quality aspects of the carpet. And now, after reorganizing these groups, we have seen, uh, we have informed weavers, we have asked weavers to support each other in their particular group. And you'll get to see how this is working in the upcoming slides. However, the process includes a meeting on each day at the loom level, which will uh, take 10 minutes of their time. And weavers of that particular loom will meet to discuss the quality aspects of the carpet, which includes on-time delivery, having no defects, and having no wastage that is being created unnecessarily. And how they are doing it? 
they they have they are given a check card uh, which is a checklist kind of a thing where they have to into 12 parameters which they measure their carpet against and support the other loops in their particular group and when they need any support they would approach quality supervisors who are now termed as quality coaches moving ahead uh, giving you an example of how it is working i would like to show you a video i hope the audio is clear Uh, yeah, there's no no audio, Harsha. Is it better now? Uh, no, no audio or video. No audio or video. Okay. Uh, you need to stop sharing the screen. Yeah. Yes. Can you see this now? No, no sound though, Harsha. Sorry. There's no, there's no, no audio. Uh, you need to enable screen sharing with audio. Can you help me with this? Sorry. Try, try sharing it again with uh, audio enabled, and then it should work. Yeah, Harsha. Is it better now? Uh, still no audio. Why? I mean, we. Pro no pro worries. I'll just go through the presentation. Yeah. Okay. Thank no you. Worries. So, just giving you examples like. These weavers today, uh, who were dependent on each of the activities on quality supervisors or branch managers for every single aspect. Today, if you look at this case studies, weavers are able to measure the progress of the carpet, and they are able to repair the looms, and they are able to check the defects of the carpet all by themselves. They don't wait for the quality supervisors or branch managers to arrive at their place to check for them. And they don't wait for any other instruction to move ahead in the process of weaving. And we are uh, in our baby steps right now. We could uh, see a few glimpses here and there. We would like to build it and scale it across the organization. And uh, I think this is this is just the beginning that uh, we could see. And uh, just speaking the philosophy of uh, our founder, our founder N K C. He always says that business is next to love. It is a creator and preserver of the civilization. And he would like to see Jaipur Rex becoming a global business ashram where he would want to pe uh, see people enjoy the empathy, creativity, and innocence of every stakeholder who is involved with this organization. Uh, thank you so much for the time. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you very much, Harsha. It would be good if you could share the YouTube link in the uh, in the chat box. It would be really useful to so see that. So we've heard some uh, brilliant stories. Jiao from uh, Fujitsu has talked about bravery. Uh, we've all seen Harsha talking about giving power to the weavers. Uh, Oleg talked about adaptability in Russia. And we've seen the rise of the ecosystem brand with uh, Mike, Mike and Wesley. Uh, Yost, what, what brings what holds all this together? Mm, <clears throat> good question. I think what's 
important to understand is that we saw with this with this cases that uh, higher in China is, is actually pioneering still the field. So they are where we see they are working on this kind of ecosystem thinking, um, taking the Randani philosophy like a uh, step ahead uh, of the crowd. So if we see the other cases that adopt like elements like micro enterprises, self-managing teams, uh, maybe some internal contracting, um, we see that many of the other companies that adapt Renanee are still adapting uh, parts of Renanee that higher already practiced maybe 10, 15 years ago in their organization in China. Um, so I think this once again, I think what Zhao says is like Renanee is like adapting Renanee is like a journey. It's a journey where you start maybe with introducing self-managing team micro enterprises and slowly build up onto that and maybe go later on into adapting EMCs, uh, ecosystem thinking, tree, uh, tree wing bird or scenario thinking. These are all elements we only know from last year, having been like uh, developed last year or over the last two years in China, in, in Qingdao actually. Um, and also in uh, what we know is that in, in also in higher China, they are not practicing this like over the entire company. There's like just a few pioneering teams like uh, Mike and Wes talked about the Peking Duck project. This is actually the, 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 the team or the, the micro enterprise that, that pioneered the EMC concept and, and did this like digital platform connecting all the micro enterprises has been only active in, 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 in higher for maybe one year. So um, I hope that was uh, illustrated by this session that if you that you can even practice Renanee if you only uh, start with micro enterprises and it might be even wise to do so and not go into uh, copy pasting models uh, one on one directly into your own organization. Yeah, I mean, I think what I'm taking away is that uh, Renden High isn't uh, a model that's um, imported on mass. It's kind of a smorgasbord of. Uh, Really, really interesting in innovative uh, management behaviors, which you, you can you, you can pick and choose to, to, to a greater or lesser extent. Uh, we're out of time. I really appreciate uh, input from every, everyone here. We've heard from uh, Mike Lee and, and Wesley from INSEAD. Uh, Wesley can now go to bed. Um, we've heard from Oleg and offering a very Russian perspective. It was re really interesting. Uh, Jao Domingos from Fujitsu, who's actually putting it to work. So that was fantastic to hear. And Harsha from Jaipur Rugs, which is an, an inspiring and, and really interesting story. So thank you very much for everyone who's joined us. Thank you for the interesting debate in, in the chat box. And thank you to all our speakers.